Well, no, 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 it was a huge night out, and uh, in my drunken stupor, I actually hit my groin on one of those chunky bollards. But as it turned out, it actually wasn't a bollard at all. I was sexually assaulted by Brad Drew. I know it might sound strange to say it, but if I had the choice between keeping Cameron Smith or Augusto Pinochet in power, I'd still lean with Pinochet. The trio would have to be Craig Gower, Jason Moody, and Sam Obst. Because I just can't see another three players fitting in musically with Craig McLaughlin and Check One Two. Well, hello and welcome to another exciting episode of The Voluntary Tackle, the only NRL podcast to sell its own Darius Boyd branded Piss Week tofu sticks. I'm your host, Eamon Brown, and today on the show we'll be discussing many of the burning issues in the world of rugby league, such as Manly re-signing the Trebojevic brothers, the ongoing saga surrounding Latrell Mitchell, and of course some predictions for next year. But first, I am joined in the studio by a very chuffed-looking Xander Risotto. Welcome back, Xander. Good to be with you, uh, Eamon. Um, I feel like this is, this is becoming a bit of a, um, a rooster celebratory podcast. The last time I was on here was after we won in 2018. I mean, Look, it's hard to keep track when you're a Roosters <laughs> fan because, uh, you know, that trophy cabinet... In fact, we've actually had to uh, disassemble some trophies because we've only had so much space. My deepest condolences to the 74-5 premierships. We had to smash them into pieces to fit in the 2019 premiership. I think uh, we just need a bigger cabinet at this point. Maybe, uh, maybe a new club headquarters. <laughs> we, can, we can move it to the other side of Anzac Parade, just extend our reach a little bit. I'd like that. Maybe Maroubra uh, Beach Pavilion. Uh, we can just open that up and make it a giant homage to the Roosters. Where, do, where does Russell Crowe's Australian house currently uh, stand? Maybe we can, we can Houses? set it up. Houses. <laughs> this is probably a fair point. Yeah, unfortunately, he is exceedingly wealthy. I, I, I think we should aim to have a, a, a um, Eastern Suburbs District Rugby League Football Club clubhouse set up in front of every single one of the properties he owns. <laughs> well, look, you, since you brought it up, Xander, um, I think that we need to talk about that first. Now, uh, don't worry, listeners, we're not going to indulge too much, I promise. But um, we do need to discuss Russell Crowe and uh, his little girl tears. Um, now, he wasn't very happy, uh, obviously, when the Roosters won the 2019 Premiership. And in fact, he took to Twitter, um, as most people with any credibility tend to do, uh, to say this, horseshit result in the NRL Grand Final, yet another rugby league embarrassment, Raiders ripped off, and of course, just as much impact as me too, hashtag six again. Um, now, we will get into the Six Again saga because I don't think we've had a podcast since the NRL took place. We won't be dwelling on it too much. But um, Xander, where is Russell Crowe coming from here? Is he just a sore loser or just a loser? Yes, on both accounts. Um, <laughs> I did see that tweet, I must confess, and I, I, I couldn't help but respond. I thought I'd try and give him a measured and what I thought was a fair uh, response to explain why it was wrong to say that... Um, the Raiders were cheated. Um, so I just posted several photos of the Roosters holding a, a myriad of trophies over the last two years. And um, and what happened? He blocked me. <laughs> I heard it was because you kept sending him dick pics too. So I don't know if that's a sort of a rich pastiche no, 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 of no, different no. offences going on the there. The dick pics, strangely, were coming from him. <laughs> he does tend to do that. It's hard to tell. I mean, you know, photos of his face, his dick, they kind of look the same. You know, in fact, they should be one of those uh, spot the difference competitions. It's just a rogue penis and Russell Crowe's face. Yeah, they're both they're both sort of you know scrunched up and wrinkly and. I know. Well, it, it doesn't bear thinking about. Uh, but look, on that on that same front, I mean, Russell Crowe, uh, we've had a lot of um, things to say about him on the show. Um, certainly, none of them complimentary. But I think, it, you know, we need to think about new ways we can piss off Russell Crowe uh, because it's a part of our resistance. Our, um, our guerrilla tactics. As Roosters fans who have just won back-to-back and on the verge of three-peat, um, how do we annoy Russell Crowe from here on in? I think for the next year at least, you and I have got to devise plans to really piss him off. I, I want to send him a, a stream of uh, a Luke Keery photos um, <laughs> with him next to the NRL Premiership Trophy or holding the Clive Churchill Medal or lifting the World Club Challenge. You know, ju- just, just things to remind him how things might have been if he hadn't been such a fuckwit. I think Luke Keery, he's the ultimate example, isn't he, of uh, Russell Crowe's destructive influence on South Sydney. You know, because this was his personality that really lost Luke Keery uh, from the club. I mean, he's, uh, for, for mine, he's probably one of the best halves in the world. Um, certainly the most influential half, I think, in the competition this year. And yet, because of pure personality differences, 
he'd gone from winning a premiership with South and he's come to the Roosters and we've benefited. Certainly that's a bragging point for us, surely. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I mean, it, it goes to show people talk uh, in the lead up to the finals, we're, we're talking, you know, endlessly about the influence that um, Hargraves has on our win percentage. A lot of that was sort of, you know, failing to take into account whether or not there were uh, a, a starting halves pairing at the same time. Mm. Um, but the really interesting stat was in the number of games that the Roosters lost when Kiri hadn't started. And I think basically in almost all the games that we lost that year, Kiri was out of the picture in some form, either injured early yeah. on. Um, you know, he's incredibly influential. I mean, Kronk uh, absolutely uh, steadies the ship and provides us with structure, but the creativity, that left edge just does not strike without Kiri there. Yeah, and the thing about Kiri is he, he could actually go to both edges. I think he's a link man, um, but particularly on that left edge. I completely agree with you. In fact, you know, for me, the Roosters' best player is James Tedesco for mine, but I think the most influential player is Luke Keary, and I think the stats bear that out. And interestingly, I know last year it's it's been etched in folklore with Cooper Cronk obviously playing on with a broken scapula, I think it was. Mm. Um, but not so much said this year about Luke Keary, who went and played with basically one leg. Uh, he went and played in the grand final with only one leg. Uh, he was clearly down on... Um, down on energy in that game. Uh, we still managed to struggle through. I think there's a bit of heroics there that probably got lost in the uh, cacophony of noises over six again. What do you think? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those injuries. It's, it's less, I mean, having a snapped scapula is, is a bit more headline gra- grabbing than... Um, <laughs> I just know. love the phrase snapped scapula. I know, it's just... Say it six times fast. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, there there is something like you know superhuman about playing an NRL grand final with with your shoulder blade effectively hanging off a thread. Mm. Um, the the Kiri effort, um, with the injury was probably a, a more similar to what Blake Ferguson had to deal with in the last year's grand final, but it's yep. more important and more influential because he's the bloody half mm. who has to create those opportunities, and you know his his mobility, um, you know, and evasiveness is is key to creating a lot of those try scoring opportunities mm. um you know we, we saw it right at the, the end of the last 10 minutes where he spotted a a, a tiring lay lure, lure and and just opened up that opportunity for trill and um, thankfully lalu is always tiring <laughs> he, <does look. laughs> he was you, he was born puffed he um he, he does have that sort of sleepy look, but it, he's got nothing on Anthony Milford, I can tell you. Like, oh, yeah. That guy always looks like he's just woken up. I think Milford doesn't want to be there, so it's almost a separate issue. But no, you're right. His mobility, Kiri, was mm. incredibly hampered in that game. Um, and yeah, I just wonder if, if there's not as much made about that. I know that people like Phil Gould have been quite vocal about the idea that it's actually much harder to play through with an injury below your waist. Yeah. Uh, it's not referring to your penis. I mean, just got your legs and ankles and it's feet. It's hard to play through with an injury to your penis. I mean, if you well. had a snap penis, I mean, you know, full credits are pushing through to the end of the game. But if you didn't need to ejaculate for any particular reason, it's not really heroics. You laugh, but I've, I've, I've heard I'm deadly serious. <laughs> those, I imagine it would be incredibly difficult uh, playing through with a snap penis. Just to put it out there, as somebody who used to work in a hospital... Those injuries are not easy to be terribly mobile with either. Okay, so you saw a lot of snapped penises come in, did you? Once or twice. Wow. I worked in an emergency ward. Jesus Christ. To this day, I didn't know that was a thing. So thanks for giving me that imagery. Blowing up like a um, purple cucumber, I believe, was how the nurse described it. Wow. Yeah. Like a giant aubergine. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Those emojis. Those emojis. Were... <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's where they come from. My favourite one. I know this is getting onto a tangent, but I... I Mate, remember... this is what that pod, this podcast <laughs> is about, so <laughs> please. We had, a, we had a guy come in It was when I was a, a student years ago, um, and he'd snapped his penis cheating on his wife. <laughs> Um, obviously with a, a fairly um, energetic younger woman. Um, anyway, though, I just always remember seeing this guy's wife storm out of his uh, hospital room, um, and I remember asking, you know, what was all that about? And apparently he would tried to tell his wife that he did it surfing. <laughs> and the thing about a snap penis is, is because it's not a bone, you actually have to have it erect for it to snap. Well, maybe he he was just catching a particularly good chew. (laughs) (laughs) Turns out he actually was. But (laughs) (laughs) But, like, I I get it. Surfing is pretty exciting. But um, (laughs) I got to tell you, maybe there's something in that because it'd be a good rudder, wouldn't it? To keep you balanced. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Hey, that guy, that centre of gravity, he's amazing. (laughs) Uh, Look, we have digressed, but I loved it. Anyway, I'm very happy we did. To be honest, totally get what Gould's saying. 
to back dovetail to the back to Phil Gould uh, with an erect penis. This is weird. Um, no, we, I wanted to actually regale you with what I did uh, after the, the Roosters won the 2019 competition because obviously I was quite happy. I was indeed erect, um, just <laughs> for the record, because uh, that's what the NRL does to me. Um, so I thought, what can I do this year uh, to really uh, let the team know that I'm a loyal fan and I love the fact that we're the first team to go back to back since 92, 93. And so I did have quite a novel thing. And uh, you're going to love this because it's quite on theme. I had uh, a picture of Mitchell Orbison tattooed on my penis. Um, that was quite a large mural. Uh, there was plenty of canvas to work with. Having said that, uh, I now have to complete the set on the other side of the testicle uh, with James Orbison, uh, which I'm not as wrapped about. But of course, I need symmetry in my life. It's a no-brainer. My wife's not happy about it, but you know, it's, uh, there's always a yin and yang to things. I, I, another thing that I did just on the theme of the Roosters and Souths not liking each other, I thought, how can I um, go and rub this wind in their face, basically? And what I ended up doing uh, the day after was dancing down Everly Street in Redfern to the tune of Grandmaster Chicken. I don't know if you remember that. It's Check Out the Chicken was the tune. And I danced down. I got all my Roosters merch together. I wore about eight different jerseys. How are you still here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it didn't end well. Um, I was brutally assaulted. Uh, but I, I'll do anything for my team. I hear, I hear, um, I hear Gus Walden attempted something similar once. Um, to, but he was in a limousine, so he could sort of drive off. Of course he was. Yeah. A few years ago when he was still on the, on the grill team, they had... Um, Something where he basically was trying to yell out South Strokes out of out of the back of a car and was copying abuse. <laughs> Pretty funny. I can't understand why they hate us, <laughs> um, mate. We uh, obviously, uh, you know, we're going to go from segment to segment here, and and we've already gone on a few digressions. But I actually, since you brought up Gus Warland, uh, can you tell the listeners a little bit about uh, how you became friends with Gus, and then why Gus now hates you? So I have a a campaign to to refresh the uh, Roosters logo basically to a version of the sort of classic 80s one just with a couple of minor touches. Mm. Can you um, tell the listeners, what's your handle? Let them, let them get on board. Oh, just at new Roosters logo. Beautiful. Nice plug. Um, yes, nice and simple. Um, but basically I tried to get um, him to provide me with a bit of a boost back in the day. Um, and, you know, he obliged a little bit here and there. Anyway, I can't remember what it was about anymore, but um, <laughs> I disagreed with Gus on something about, like, it was some petty issue. I said, no, mate, I think you're full of shit on that. And, you know, it was a polite disagreement. And he private messaged me and, and told me how disappointed he was in me um, that I disagreed with him on. <laughs> you go, sorry, Dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, mate, really disappointed in that. And, you know, I backed you before. And he was referring to your logo. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Backed you, or did he back you like in some kind of legal case? No, no. no he, so he, he wasn't your sort of character witness. He retweeted something for me, you know, which I appreciated. Don't get me wrong, but it was mm. just an interesting, interesting response from yeah. from a public media personality uh, to <laughs> to go out of his way to be that upset that I didn't support some random arbitrary um, news <laughs> issue that he'd taken a position on. That's really funny. And yeah. and for the record, are you still following him, and he's following you, or is that relationship ended? Um, yeah, I barely use Twitter anymore. I actually haven't checked if he's still following me. Mm. Yeah, I, th- I think he still is, but... Um, yeah, I think he's been fired from the grill team or whatever. Fired, I don't from, think... fired from Triple M, rather. Yeah, he has left Triple Triple M recently. I don't actually know what's happened there, but uh, I guess without Matty Johns and, and the rest of them, he's mm. probably a little less compelling. Um, interestingly, I don't know if anyone of uh, the listeners saw this, but Gus Wallen, I think it might have been on his last day, um, was singing a Spando ballet song, uh, That's Gold. It turns out he's actually got a great singing voice. Yeah, I'd, right. never, I'd never have picked it. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, he, he, wasn't he um, in like the same media class as Hugh Jackman? I believe Something so. Something like that? Yeah, it might have been a performing arts yeah. class He's too. mentioned it once or twice that, I that they're good so. mates. <laughs> yeah. Just it, every, doesn't talk about it very often. No. It's every, come, you know, I, I have seen that they're good friends. Yeah, exactly. It's every seven minutes now. <laughs> As I said in the top of the show, Xander, um, we're not going to dwell on this because it's, it's a little while now. Uh, all the celebrations have been had. All the controversy has died down. Um, but just to get things off our chest, I thought it would be important that we quickly discuss uh, Six Again Gate. Of course, uh, referring to the hashtag Six Again, uh, that a lot of disgruntled Raiders, uh, particularly Souths fans, had uh, over the grand final. Um, I want to start by getting your thoughts. Do you think uh, it was all blown out of proportion or have people got a point with that refereeing blunder? Oh, it was massively blown out of proportion. I mean, I appreciate the fact that we're Roosters fans, so people are going to say we're biased. We're slightly biased. But, yeah. but even, accounting, even accounting for that, like, this was not... People, people carried on about this. I, I always felt that this was largely driven by the fact that there was a narrative, you know, that, geez, wouldn't it be great for the underdogs to win? And, and that was disappointed by the result. Um, 
but people were talking about this six again call as if it was a try no try decision. It wasn't. Mm. You know, it was it was one missed opportunity for the Raiders to get in an attacking kick uh, at the end of a set, and the Roosters got the turnover. They were they were they had a bit of luck to get that, but they still had to make it ninety meters. To break the deadlock. Yeah. They still had to like look through the line and go, oh, Lalu is asleep. Let's yeah. run at him because he's having a bit of a siesta. And 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 frankly, you know, I mean, if it, and and this has been the point, this is this was made on, on other podcasts as well, but you, you wouldn't want, We don't talk about those, mate. <laughs> but you you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to think that a, a team's chances of winning a grand final were down to whether or not they could defend a set of six. 90 meters from their try line or not you know exactly I mean, one bad call there were a number of bad calls and that's that's come out after the match in fact the referees have admitted on a number of occasions that the roosters have been dotted uh, through the game as well you know bad calls just happen whether or not they're absolute howlers if, if there's an absolute howler at the end that's a penalty trial like the 99 grand final i can kind of understand it it's 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 a really really big call but this was although that was a genuinely right decision too. it was but it's 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 a it's a decision that directly impacts on whether or not points are going to be awarded you're this quite was, right this was not that yep no you're right i thought it was pretty tenuous and I, I think it was part of the the underdog narrative i think and i understand that that the roosters have been quite dominant and the idea of that most punters would like to see the raiders win i completely i can empathize mm. with that but <clears throat> particularly in that decision as you said this was actually the correct call. Mm. Like the wrong call was made initially. Then the correct call was made. And yeah, it did affect Whiten's ability to put in an attacking kick. Mm. But if you weigh that up against, you know, a myriad of kind of pretty dud calls during the game, uh, twice the Raiders dropped the ball cold. Yeah. And they got penalties for it. Yeah. And they were putting up bombs left, right. There was a lot of there was a lot of low percentage plays. Their attacking game wasn't that good. And that was why they only scored one try. And yeah, they had incredible defense and credit mm. to them. Um but they weren't creating much. They were putting up those bombs. And there was a couple in the lead up to their first try, they got a six again ruling that shouldn't have been given to them. Yeah, no, that's right. And you've, you had an interesting take. Well, I shouldn't say interesting. I, I believe it might be the right one. But um, there, we, we were perceived to get a big stroke of luck uh, with our trainer. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And now, were you telling me before that there's, in terms of the rule, that was actually the correct, the correct decision? Oh, you know, I mean, and this is, again, one of those things I don't want to go too much over it, but... Um, the, the the decision was correct that if a if a trainer is out there um, or any any third party that's not on either side then could be a naked streaker. Yeah. So I mean you know it's been covered by by the media. What if it was Paul Bongiorno? <laughs> Would it still be the same rule? Like if, a, if a ball hit a political reporter's head. On the field in a grand final, would that be six again? Probably be more um, uh, more defensible. In fact, um, <laughs> I, I think it should be twelve again. 12. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, I've interrupted you. Um, now, I mean, the, the point about that that incident was they said, "Oh, they got a leg up there." I mean, you know, if you watch that tackle um, that uh, uh, Sol Ella comes in and takes Kiri out mid air, mm. should have been a penalty. The Roosters. Willie Mason said it on Channel Nine as well. A number of people have, have recognised it after the fact. Mm. But everyone... I love the fact you've cited Willie Mason as the bastion of truth. I, I actually agree with that call. He does, I know he doesn't like the Roosters, so I mean, it was it was it was telling that even he thought it was a ridiculous uh, decision. To, That's right. Yeah. Although I think he thinks that uh, most brutal assaults should be legalised. So uh, you know, you t- take it with a grain of salt. That said, and, and again though, I mean, you know, yeah, the Roosters ended up getting the scrum feed after that. They still had. I mean, you know, the Raiders didn't have to concede the points, right? Like, mm. uh, Verrill's spots again a couple of lazy defenders, and and you know goes in for a try and it was a it was a heck of an opportunity opportunistic moment but um you know it wasn't actually off the first set of six off that scrum anyway it was after they got a repeat set and then had a second yeah. crack. so they you know these two decisions that are, that are being talked about um uh, yeah for my mind they were it, it is more about the underlying narrative of geez you know uh the, the, would have been better if the Raiders had been able to get up. And they put in a great performance. I thought the Raiders were, were fantastic. Mm. Mate, we want to talk about uh, internationals next. Um, I actually thoroughly enjoyed the series. Uh, there's obviously a few black marks against certain games, um, namely the Kangaroos in that last match against Tonga. But uh, I have to say, I want to start off by uh, sending out a huge congratulations to Tonga. Um, I think their team's been improving over the last five years out of sight, that they've finally come to fruition. They're a genuine world force. And, you know, it used to be the point, uh, the, the day where it, they had a, a decent back line, some good forwards, and they never had a half. Now, 
I'm going to put it out there. I think they've got the best forward pack in the world. Um, I've got some of the names here. Tao Malolo, Tiki Aho, Pangai Jr., Fanua Blake, Fafita. I mean, get fucked, Tonga. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's ridiculous. Just, it's ridiculous as a forward pack. Exactly. And they've also got an amazing back line. Um, and, and, and the weakness, as I said, traditionally has been the halves. But uh, Lola Hia, he had that yep. ball on a string. So Lola Hia can comprehensively uh, by himself outplayed Cherry Evans and... Um, Munster. Munster, yeah. Oh, we'll get to them. Uh, but first, I want to get your thoughts on Tonga. How do you think they're faring? Do you think that they deserve all the accolades that they're getting at the moment? Oh, absolutely they do. I mean, it's, it's, it's been interesting. They're, they have been a test case for whether or not, um, you know, they should be... Um, uh, whether or not it was a good idea to allow uh, players to represent, you know, sort of first and second tier countries, you know, because you... you there, there was a whole theory that you cheapened the national jerseys and all the rest of it. But I actually disagree with that in... in, in from a, uh, a purely, um, uh, you know, philosophical standpoint, in, in the current age where there is basically a ton of migration around the world, I mean, you know, there are a lot of people with dual identities. It is, it is kind of a bit ridiculous mm. to be asking people to represent one country. Exactly. Like you, I mean, Jackson Hastings is English. <laughs> English I don't know if you knew that or not. So but I feel like Jackson Hastings is a slightly different case. I, 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 don't, I don't buy the, you know, my great-great-great-grandmother. <laughs> Mate, uh, if, dual of... identities. <laughs> Let's stick to the theme. And remember this, Luke Rickardson, he's Scottish. Anyway, proceed. I thought he was Irish. Oh, he's Irish, mate. He's, he was um, captain of Ireland. <laughs> um, <laughs> forgive my uh, white racism. <laughs> yes. No, but I mean, you know, for, for people like that whose families, you know, have legitimately come over and settled in, you know, Australia and New Zealand from, from Tonga or somewhere or, you know, other parts of the world. Mm. You know, they've grown up in those households that, you know, a lot of them, you know, still speak the language at home. They share a strong identity with 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 Tonga. Um, you know, I think I think it's they have a, it's absolutely every right to to want to represent them, you know, even if they have represented Australia before, because they will also want to represent their home. And and for Australia, of course, we had um, uh, you know a couple of the players who could have also represented Tonga and, and have come out and said you know they wanted to play for Australia first. Yeah, and that's I, I think that is that's completely fine. You know, it gives them that option. But what's the what's the counter argument? about not wanting someone who wants to represent Tonga, who's from Tonga, to play for their country. It seems like a no-brainer to me. I love oh, it. Yeah. I love the fact that um, there's more pride in the jersey. And it used to be almost more about financial benefit before, yeah. obviously, yeah. that they weren't getting anywhere near the paycheck yeah. uh, to play for their home country if well, they were it? playing for New Zealand or Australia. I think that's still the case. It is. They, they're, they're copying a financial um, sort of hit by not... Because yeah. I think you get paid about 30 grand a match for Australia and New Zealand or something along those It was lines. something... I think they have raised a little bit. I'm yeah. pretty sure it was something like fifteen hundred dollars or something. Oh, really? At yeah. one point, I, I know Origins thirty grand. I know. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, look. Regardless, even if it actually seems like almost a better story mm. if they're playing for their home country and taking the financial yeah. hit. It yeah. shows that they have pride in their jersey and pride for their country. They want to play for it. And and it's not about. It's not an economic decision. And frankly, I think that's why they won. Um, you know, yeah. they, they they were they were up for that game and then some. You know, whereas the the kangaroos. I think they were really up for that New Zealand game. They wanted to prove a point after losing last year. And they were great against the Kiwis a week before. Mm. But they did play like a side who, who didn't have the passion of their opposition when they were playing Tonga. They didn't. I think that was very evident. As you said, I mean, look, a lot's been made of uh, the Kangaroos going through a major change of the guard moment. You've got... Obviously, no, Thla no Slater, no Thurston, Smith, Inglis, Cronk. Uh, Jamie Bure is missing. That would have hurt. Uh, but this, to me, was not a talent drain. This was a mentality issue. Mm. Um, and I, I'm going to have a particular um, chagrin for uh, the likes of Dale, Daly Cherry Evans and Munster as well. Um, and to a lesser extent, Latrell Mitchell. Uh, but I, I did think that the halves in particular had an attitude problem. It was a lack of involvement. And to me, I don't know if this is overstating it, but they let down the jersey. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I probably focused more of my criticism on, on the halves. I thought Luttrell had two critical errors that led to Tongan tries. but Just the what, two? I thought it was 22. <laughs> there were, there were, so oh, critical errors. Gotcha. Critical errors. Um, <laughs> To be fair to Latrell, um, I think what when he was like they really targeted him, and he and he was throwing his body on the line to try and really, and he he yeah. was actually I think I thought Latrell was really playing playing hard. I think he was trying as and, well, and, and, I, uh, and I, I thought he put in like you know he copped a lot of criticism, but you know he he made those errors because he was putting his body on the line, and they were trying to make a point of smashing him, and just the you know the the risk factor there is just higher, and that's how mm. you get those. Well, like balls. I'll say this, I actually think that he's just not in great form. I actually don't think he should have been selected. 
Well, I mean, to be fair, he set he set up a couple of cracking tries in the the New Zealand uh, test the week before. I thought he had a, a great game against mm. the Kiwis the week before. Um, you know, like that um, he, that intercept and, and offload to Addo Carr was sens- Absolutely, sensational. Yeah. One thing about Latrell is he can have amazing moments. Mm. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I think his tally on aggregate, when you look at his error rate, so even for the Roosters, I think you and I have discussed this. I'm not sure if you're in total agreement, but you know, for me, he was the guy that I worried about. Even though he's got probably one of the biggest reputations in the team, mm. I worried about him being the loose cannon who might drop the ball, who might give away a penalty, who might leak a try, versus anyone else in the team. And I thought, you know, it's not like the Kangaroos have a shortage of outside back talent. That, that is true, but I, I from from a defensive standpoint, I, mm. I, I have I, I had had that criticism previously, but I think particularly through the final series and actually in, in the tests, yep. uh, he really aimed up in defence. And he, in that test against Tonga, he was putting on big hits as well. He, they he did was, smash him too. They, like, they, you they, know, smashed they targeted him. him. And if you, if you watch that game, the, the tries that were scored, um, you know, they, they weren't defensive failures of Luttrell's. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I, I was, I, I did see the, you know, like there was a lot of focus on the fact that his errors gave them possession and they scored off them, mm. but you know, that we shouldn't have let those tries in our, our defensive structures uh, by and large, we should be able to defend as the kangaroos a set of six or two. What do you make of Munster and Cherry Evans now clearly very talented players? Um, but you know, the knock on someone like Cherry Evans, for example, has been that every so often, uh, probably too regularly, he puts in a game where he seems a bit disinterested or uninvolved. And certainly that game like against the past Tonga. Five seasons. <laughs> well, no, I mean he can have periods where he's brilliant. I have to, I have to concede yeah. that. Uh, whereas someone like Munster is usually very competitive uh, in in most matches, even if he needs to break the rules to be competitive. Not necessarily a nice person, but an effective one. Um, but in that match, I Kicking felt like people Ma- on the ground for instance. exactly. You know, big shout out to Manu. Um, but in that game, it just felt like he was playing a game of park football. He didn't respect mm. the possession of the ball. There were moments when Munster ran at the line where passes weren't, weren't, weren't on and he just threw it anyway. So that was his issue. And I thought Cherry Evans' issue was the fact that he had very little involvement. He had a little involvement and he, had, and he, made, uh, he took poor options. There were a few uh, periods at the back end of the game in particular where, where the Kangaroos got repeat sets. And Cherry Evans was, was, was taking low percentage plays mm. early in the sets um, you know, rather than building pressure, there was a particular moment that I have. Um, I didn't. I really didn't like what Cherry Evans did. It was, a, I think, the fifty-fifth minute, and they were in an attacking position. And instead of getting into first receiver to get the ball, uh, he was in the crowd cashing a very large check. But uh, look, leaving Australia aside, um, let's talk about England's performance. Now, you've been particularly vocal, Xander in your condemnation of one Wayne Bennett. I think it's because you're quite ageist uh, rather than his performance. But Wrinkly walk old me, fuck. <laughs> walk me through that. Is it because he has the head of a large, giant, dried apricot or is it because you don't like his tactics? I think, he, I think he's always been a very boring coach, Wayne. Like, I mean, <laughs> effective, though, you have e- to admit. Effective, but yeah, I mean, he's, 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 um, his approach for 30 years has been basically just, you know, complete your sets and build pressure. <laughs> you know, like... It's it's the same thing, you know. We're gonna. I feel like you might be reducing him a bit too much there, but no, go but on. He he plays low risk football, right? Like he, he coaches low risk football. I mean, that's you, true. You look at you look at the way. I mean, the, the there's there's not there's not much agility or or uh, you know out of the box thinking with him when it comes to how to change tactics from season to season. He's always coached that way, and, and if you look at. Um, what Trent Robinson did with the Roosters this year. I mean, the Roosters had one of the lowest completion rates in the comp. Yeah. And they won the damn thing. And he made the point that, you know... Much you, to my frustration at times. Well, but, you know, he, he did make the point and he was proven right, ultimately, is that you can chase completions or you can chase opportunities. And, um, you know, if you back your defence, mm. um, then, you know, you, you can play a, a, fo- a type of football uh, that will lead to more points, even if it is a little bit higher risk uh, at times. Yeah, look, there's something to be said for that. Obviously, you know, there was a notoriously a North Queensland Cowboys side uh, before they became good. I think it was around the mark of the 2000s. But they used to have the highest completion rate in the game and get duly smashed <laughs> each and every match. So it isn't all about completions. You're completely right. At the same time, uh, not to harp on the Roosters, but, you know, our completion rates, although low and we were trying to attack, which is a good thing, I, I, I think the scary thing for the rest of the competition should be I don't think we've got our attack in order just yet. I think we can be a lot better. Uh, our defence, obviously, I think Robbo is a bit defence-oriented and it is the best defence in the game. Um, but I think there's a few calibrations that the Roosters could potentially make in attack. Um, but when it comes to Wayne, I, th- I feel like I'm going to defend the old man here. 
from your uh, from your outlandish attacks and your blatant ageism. <laughs> Just for like labeling you a bigot it's fun um but no i think that the thing that uh, wayne has going for him is the fact that he is a coach that can play the crop of players that he has so he hasn't got a, a cookie cut template um i think you know if he has a crop of really naturally talented players for example you know i think he lets them play a little bit more football and obviously he had a quite a few brisbane broncos sides that were very flamboyant and didn't play boring football because he knew he had the talent and then he won a comp with St George, for example, in a completely different style. And I think he, you know, played a lot more of that completion esque type so you, of footy. You arguing that I'm simplifying Wayne a little bit? A little bit. And I'll tell you one another thing that I know he's good at because I've heard a number of players talk about it. But um, he's great man manager, yeah. right? So one thing that Wayne does is not. It's not all about the team strategy. He'll go up to each and every player and give them very simple tasks and say, you know, Sam Thiday, this is what I want out of you. And usually it's one or two things. He goes, I'll be happy with you if you just do that. Because mm. he understands like the game of chess, what each piece he wants them to do. So I think there's a little bit more um, uh, genius involved with Wayne no, I, that I, I maybe is right. not evident I, on the surface. But, but, but specifically going back to England, um, obviously they've underperformed quite considerably. Wait, wait, wait. England have and Great Britain have. Oh, sorry, of course. Great Britain. Of this, course, this, that is an important well, distinction we, to we make. We need to get back to this after. <laughs> That's right, we will. Um, Great Britain, I should say. Um, what are your major criticisms of the way they've played? Well, you know, it's exactly what I complain about. I think they're before. too boring. I think, I, think, I think they just played really one-dimensional uh, football. Um, mm. Is it the fact that they played Blake Austin on the wing? <laughs> they played, what were they thinking? They played Blake Austin on the wing and they, and they started Jackson Hastings. I mean, mm. I just thought, you know, I mean... I watched that Super League Grand Final and, and Hastings. I mean, I, I don't I like the way you've rolled your eyes at Jackson Hastings there, mate. mate he's as English as a spotted dick. <laughs> all right, he's he's the latter part. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I just I thought I thought wait, I didn't like the fact that he was choosing. You know, a side like Tonga, who are who are picking players who've grown up in Australia but whose parents are Tongans. You know, I get that. Bloody, you know, like England should not be picking Australians. I love sake. the I love the SOS call. Blake Austin on the wing. It just, <laughs> it's an SOS to a player who's not in the NRL anymore, who in a position he's never played. Yeah, I mean, they're just bizarre selection choices. And it was, you know, apparently the, the selection choices were made with a view to the next World Cup, which I, I just don't understand. But I also thought, it, you know, what he did by doing that, he not only um, cheapened, you know, representation of England, he, he kind of killed the, the entire purpose of reviving the Lions. Yeah. You know, I mean, I... <laughs> I felt that it was way too early to revive the Lions anyway. I mean, the mm. concept is kind of rooted in a, a, a very different sort of geopolitical world where you, you've got um, uh, Great Britain as, an, as a political entity operating as, at one point, you know, still, still uh, the most important political power on the planet. Is this pre or post-Brexit? This is definitely pre EU. I would like um, to see the kangaroos take on UKIP. UKIP I think that'd yes. be great. Nigel, Nigel Farage could be halfback. I, I'd enjoy that. Okay, um, but proceed. Love, love, to see, love to see Papali running at him. <laughs> <laughs> just, just. I'd love to there. see Papali just running through the House of Lords, <laughs> just palming off MPs with but, impunity. Uh, I think that you know, I felt that they should have just gone as England if it was going to be preparation for the, the World Cup, and and with Wayne taking that approach, clearly, you know he. There's obviously a conflict there between the the rugby football league in the UK and what Wayne's trying to achieve. Um, just just didn't have it. They weren't on the same page clearly. Yeah. And I thought that um, if you're going to bring back Great Britain, you probably need to be bringing them back at a time when you have professional rugby league sides in England, Wales, and uh, sorry, so in Ireland, uh, Wales, and Scotland, and and they're probably going to be there in 20 years. I mean, I, I've, mm. I've read about the what, Dublin Blues. Uh, bid to get into the Super League. Yep. That apparently, is you know gaining traction and, and support. You know, you, once you get to a point where you've got a, a genuine crop of, of players who could represent, you know, uh, like a, an Ireland national team, actually predominantly being Irish, and and Scotland and Wales as well. Ideally, yeah. yeah. Then then it or makes at least members of the IRA. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, the new IRA. But it, I mean, it, it it then makes sense to have a British and Irish lines. Yeah. Uh, concept revived. Do you think that the English team or the Lions uh, need to have an English coach? Do you think that's part of the problem? To have an old cantankerous Australian coach uh, controlling things maybe doesn't have the country's best interest at heart. Well, I mean, it doesn't seem to bother them in every other sport they have. I mean, it was Eddie Jones <laughs> coached them to a World Cup final in, in the uh, Union. They've got Trevor Bayliss who's given them a... a, a well, Mate, uh, you've, 
you, you've read the notice boards on the on, on the wall here. There is no mention of rugby union allowed. In fact, it's it's like blasphemy in this studio. <laughs> but you're quite right. They're they're known to adopt. You know, you know what's even worse? You, <laughs> just just talking about blasphemy. So Eddie Jones, an Australian who coached England to a World Cup final in rugby, has a great admiration for rugby league, but he wants to come and coach Souths at some point. Wow. So yeah. that's his ultimate aspiration, isn't yeah. it? At his highest apparently, goal. Apparently he's always wanted to have a crack at uh, coaching rugby league because uh, he grew up watching it and mm. all the rest of it. And... Do you know what I appreciate? You've taken a rugby union tangent and you've looped it back to the NRL. That was brilliant. Well, I mean, you know... I don't know if you've made up news there, but if you haven't, kudos to you. England have been famous for having the, taking, taking rugby league uh, products in, in, into rugby union. So, I mean, it's, right. you know... Well, okay, let's, let's take that scenario one step further. Could Eddie Jones be successful as the South Sydney coach? Would he get on well with Russell Crowe? I think Russell Crowe would have to check his ego at the door by the sounds of things. He's a pretty <laughs> pretty intense guy. I remember yeah. uh, seeing an interview with Craig Wing talking about uh, being coached by Eddie Jones in Japan. Yep. And um, of course, Eddie's half Japanese. I think he's kind of got that, that you know, I mean, he, he's, he speaks the language, but he grew up in Australia. He's still got that Japanese mindset in a lot of ways, I think, yep. um, of, of really just trying to work around the clock and he did that with the Japanese team right like he was famous for basically having them uh, train you know six days a week for mm. basically six months into leading that and, and Wing said he'd never trained as hard in his life okay wow well, um, I'm glad you said it was the Japanese mentality of working around the clock and not manga porn because um, I didn't think that would be very conducive to being an NRL coach. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, but I, I think I think it'd be interesting to see how he'd go. Like I mean, there have been a few cases of, of coaches have tried it. I mean, Alan Jones fancies himself as, as being the best at, at everything, and he coached Alan the Jones Wallabies. just fancies himself yes. full stop, doesn't he? <laughs> but you know, he, he coached he, obviously the Wallabies through a successful period before you know basically stuffing up the '87 World Cup campaign, and mm. um, then he went and coached what the South Souths and Tigers, Souths and Tigers, yeah. And they, I think, they made 13th and 14th respectively. That's right, yeah. And he was very famous giving his team strategies in the showers, yeah, uh, which I don't think went down too well <laughs> no. in the very macho world of rugby league at the time. No, um, we're going to move along, mate, to the Golden Boot. Now, um, this is interesting. It's down to three people. And luckily for us, uh, two of them happen to be Chooks. So at this point, uh, we're actually of, of this point of recording, I should say. Um, it's between Roger Tuavasa Shek, Jared Maria Hargraves, and Tikiaho, who we like to affectionately refer to as TKO. Uh, I'm going to put this question to you, mate. Of those three people, who should win? I, I'm leaning toward Takiaho, to be honest. Um, okay. I think I'm that, with you. Yeah. I'm I'm a massive Tikiaho fan. Like Tuvasa Shek, he, he's an electric player, but um, you know he he, he hasn't always um, done the most uh, in in the New Zealand jersey. I mean, he's 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 been impressive um, in individual moments, but I don't think he has the instinct of of um, uh, other fullbacks. He's not quite. Um, he's he's not quite as good in support play in, in my view, and I don't think he stands out as much. Even even accounting for the fact that Golden Boot is, boot is purely tests. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to say this. I'm going to be. I don't know if this is too controversial, but to me, um, I actually think Roger might be slightly overrated. Um, I, I know he's a class player. I think the thing that fools a lot of people. Fools is probably a strong term, but it's the fact that uh, Roger looks amazing when he moves, right? Mm. And I mean that in a strictly non-sexual sense, obviously. <laughs> um, but no, he's got an a, amazing step and footwork and he's a lot he glides like a... across the turf. But there's almost this little bit of, because of that, mm. um, I think it compensates for his effectiveness a little bit. I don't think he's a, as effective um, as someone, say, a James Tedesco is. Um, so for me, it, it, he kind of reminds me, and I'm not underselling him here, I hope, but he reminds me of a character called Anthony Mitchell. I'm not sure if anyone remembers him. Uh, we used to refer to him as the shadow uh, for the Roosters because he had a lot of energy, looked great, uh, but no one ever gave him the ball because he was shit. But I don't want to sidetrack things. How do you see Roger? Am I right in saying he's overrated? I think, uh, I mean, I, don't, I, I suppose the fact that he's up for this, this award means he's quite highly rated. I, I guess I because the Warriors just aren't there, I, I, I don't see him. I, I feel like to be overrated, you need to be in the conversation a lot. And because the Warriors aren't in the conversation, he's not really. So I kind of feel like he's, he's accurately rated for the most part. Fair enough. Do you I, feel I, the same way of Sean Johnson when he was playing over there? Was, yeah. he, was he a victim of the Warriors not being great as well? 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think Sean Johnson has shown that everywhere he goes, he's about the same. <laughs> to be honest, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he kind of he made some pretty poor decisions for his country, and you have to admit for uh, for the Sharkies yeah. this year, there were some key moments where he just had shockers. He, he, I mean, he was great in that last game against Great Britain, but you know, he he was pretty average, obviously, against Australia, which is why they dropped him for foreign. Yeah. But um. I don't know. I've I've always felt that he's he's pretty hot and cold, um, and it's seemed to he seemed to be like that everywhere. Whereas, whereas Tuivasa-Shek, um, he definitely is a very talented ball runner. But I, as you say, I don't think he's got the instincts uh, and ability to read the the play as well as a, a player like Tedesco at fullback. Just because Tedesco is always there in support, whereas I feel like um, in a one-on-one situation, um, it's very hard to beat Shek. Uh, but it, he he's not part of the key players in the same way that um, he reminds me. Uh, uh, if I was p- going to think of a player to compare him to, it's probably Anthony Jason Mitchell. <laughs> Jason Robinson, who used to play for for England. Oh yep, yep. You know, in both codes, like he's twinkle toes kind of players, but they're not they're not necessarily the guys who know exactly where to be all the time. Exactly, and you could look at the just the sheer fitness mm-hmm. and involvement rate of a James Tedesco. I think it overshadows a two of us as well. Uh, the third man we haven't mentioned is uh, Jared Rurea Hargraves. Do you think he has a chance of winning the Golden Boot? He's he was, had a sensational year. He was he was immense in uh, in the the last couple of games for England. Even in the in the games that um, I mean for New Zealand, even in the game that they they lost to Australia, Hargraves had a, had a pretty solid game. Yeah, Absolutely, he made tons of meters. So I, I think he was I, very solid against uh, Kalen Ponga's face <laughs> at one point as well. I commend him for that. <laughs> Likewise, um, yeah. I, I think it's to me it's in terms of influence on games. I feel like it's. It should be down to to um, Taukaho or, or Hargraves. I'd probably be leaning more towards Taukaho because he's also a goal kicker and he kicked brilliantly through through the series for Tonga. He did, and I, I don't know if it, if it factors in or not because I guess the judges are all human beings. But I think there's also an, an element of maybe let's give Taukaho the recognition that he finally deserves <laughs> because even in his own team, uh, all the talk this year has been about uh, Rory Hargraves mm. for the most part. Um, obviously, they're bringing out the stat about you know when Hargraves plays versus when he doesn't. Very little talk about Tikiaho, and in fact, a lot of the time I've noticed when um, the, the NRL pundits talk about Jared being out of the team, there's very little. Well, it's okay, we've got Tikiaho there. It's it's the fact that we're losing something. And so, who, and who was it in the in the semi final against the Storm when they were all talking about the influence that um, uh, Hargraves uh, was going to have uh, by not being there? Yep. Um, I who, know where you're going. Yeah, who, who, who turned the game? It was Tikiaho. He, he came on uh, basically provoked uh, Solomona straight up. <laughs> they both got sent off, uh, but it was... Yeah. Effect- it, Wasn't it a great start to a match? It, it was... It disrupted Melbourne from the get-go. It did, and, yeah. and he had a cracking game. I think I think he's... Yeah. He, he's His influence is not recognised anywhere near because of the fact that Hargreaves is so good and so influential himself. And, when you, and I don't, don't want to go back too far, but obviously on Anzac Day, Tikiaho was the hero yeah. that day yeah, as well. Scored great, under the posts. Spotted uh, a couple tiring forwards. Exactly. Band. He's been doing it for many years. Yeah. So uh, good on you, TKO. I hope you win. Um, now, there's a few other little um, Golden Boot Awards that I, I think the voluntary tackle are trying to propose. I want to ask you straight away here, Xander. Um, who do you think would win the Golden Barley Coward Punch Award? Now, just to let you know, uh, Dave Fafita, he's a raging hot favourite. He's $1.55 on Sportsbet. Big Nelson, uh, rightly so, he's blowing out to $6.50. Who do you think is going to win that one? Oh, you have to give it to Solomon. The footage was just incredible. I mean, Can it, I, let's, it's, it's the mo- I, I guess what, what are the criteria for this award? I mean, if, if it's how much the punch costs, then Fafita wins it easily. Apparently, he spent like 30 grand on yeah, that punch. Out of court settlement. Yeah. yeah. I, I got to say, not to trivialise an assault, but you know who the fuck picks on Nelson Asofi Solomona? Who? Well, apparently they picked on Vunavalo, and, and Solomona came in to to basically save the guy because they're about to glass him. Yeah, right. Um, I, yeah, but but even if the footage shows someone shaping up to him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who shapes up to a man mountain <laughs> who looks enraged? Yeah. Like, is that an act of suicide? Could you actually call that a jihad? I think that's a. a, a, a <laughs> I think I think that is that is a uh, <laughs> how do I put this? That is something that only barley and alcohol can make somebody do. <laughs> and it goes to my reason why I think that every NRL player should have barley banned in their contract negotiations. They really should, shouldn't they? That's just an off limit like, zone. Just for fuck's sake, guys, stop going to Bali. Go to Japan. <laughs> Come on, Cambodia is where it's really at. <laughs> 
Um, look, other awards that we've proposed on the show. Uh, who would win the Golden Noose? Now, we've uh, just to explain what the this Golden is. Noose. This is the award that goes to the biggest choker uh, in, in rugby league Good. terms. Now, um, we're proposing potentially the entire Brisbane Broncos team. Uh, might be a massive chance, obviously, uh, because any time there was any kind of game on the line, uh, nobody decided to turn up. In fact, eventually they did once they finished their big poker machine session. Um, but we've also, uh, you know, we should respect this award because it's been uh, actually going around legitimately for a number of years. And big shout out to Mitchell Pierce, who has owned this award for me <laughs> for a long time now. Um, are there any other players that you think, uh, or teams rather, that might win the Golden Noose? My favourite, obviously, is always going to be Ben Hunt in 2015. <laughs> um, like he was, he was a genuine, you know, head and shoulders above everyone else that year. Um, he really was. I. I it's funny, when a, when a high ball goes up, particularly a kickoff or a restart, his eyes start rolling into the back of his head. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. It's clearly a form of trauma uh, that he's never going to get out of. Um, and even this year, there was a, a dropout restart, which ended up costing the Dragons of the game. Um, and I just feel like it's a kind of re- a repeated trauma. It's like, um, I don't know, say you're a rape survivor um, and he's getting gang raped on average, three times a year. It's very sad. It's, <laughs> did I go it's, too far? It's still an evocative <laughs> way to describe it. <laughs> but this year, that, I, that I, will probably get I, edited I, out. I, just I, so I, you know. <laughs> so I was, I was mulling through, you know, potential players from this year, and then just kind of tuned back in as you went into gang rape. <laughs> just <laughs> in answer to your question, I mean, I'm kind of in a funny sort of way. I'm leaning to Sam Burgess. I feel like he had a shocker of a year, and he was expect like. There was huge expectation on him, you know. And Wayne Bennett was was sort of, um, you know, credited with with managing him really well, and, and not to your earlier point about being, about being the great man manager. But I thought by the end of the year, he just it completely reverted to his shitty, like sort of grubby tactics and 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 making poor decisions in big plays, dropping balls at critical moments. I think he probably, if you're going to talk about a player whose whose inability to perform in the big moments when it mattered, I'd probably put Sam Burgess up there. Well, you know, he's just had a shocker of a year, hasn't he? So, obviously, he's retired prematurely because of injury. Um, he's, he's, his whole relationship's busted up. He's in front of the courts on an AVO. Um, you know, he's just not had a good year. Um, and in his defence, I get the feeling that he's been playing with some pretty serious injuries for a few years mm. now. And if you watched him play in the few games that he played this year, he really didn't play too many because he was injured. He almost was running with the ball with one hand yeah. and holding his neck with the other. I have a feeling that no other player apart from Sam Burgess would have been even on the field with the level of injury that he had. Um, and a lot of people were having a go at him in that last South game. I think it was against Manly. Mm. And they gave it to him. Manly. Oh, yeah. Manly played really well this year. But like for him, I think it's really ballsy. If he's running in with major shoulder and neck issues, he never backed down. He was, like, he was running 110%. Okay, he's nowhere near as effective as he was. And he was making some errors. You're right yeah. in saying that. But... I got to say that the man has balls. Of I, I steel. think. I think. I think he, you cannot fault Sam Burgess's courage. The guy clearly, yeah. clearly would would um, or stupidity, whatever, yeah. however you frame it. <laughs> yeah, he 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 would be a stunt man, you know, in any other life, probably just given the 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 disregard he has for his own health. <laughs> You're right. Um, but I I think my my comment was more about his judgment. Yeah, you know, in big games and big moments, like like he was very frustrated this year. Yeah, and and, and I think his frustration comes out in those dirty tactics. To be honest with you, when he's yeah, sorry, I think you're right, and that, that's that's kind of what I was getting at. I think the dirty tactics were a sign of frustration and things not. And but I think you you kind of need in a in a senior leader like leadership role like that for a player, you need them to be able to shrug off that frustration and, and mm-hmm. make mature choices that will benefit your team. Whereas yeah. I felt like too often. He allowed emotion to get the better of him and disadvantaged his side when it mattered. And how good is it you can have a bad year where you show ill discipline and yet still be the most disciplined brother in your family? <laughs> uh, big shout out to George Burgess, uh, who tried to perform some impromptu brain surgery on Robbie Farrow <laughs> earlier in the year. Well done, sir. Didn't uh, find anything somehow. Unfortunately, yeah, that's right. Uh, he found a few things, but they were all quite rigid and boring. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Burgesses, uh, I think Sam Burgess is going to be a big loss from the NRL personally. I loved watching him play. Um, but just to dovetail back very quickly to the Golden Noose, uh, just for my proposal, um, I would actually like to put forward Dylan Walker. Uh, oh, actually, wait a second. No, he, actually, he was typically choking somebody else, wasn't he? <laughs> 
Um, no, that I'll, I'll actually strike that one from the record. He might pick up the Golden Scumbag Award, but uh, um, we're going to finish this segment uh, on a very high note, Xander. Uh, who do you think would win the Golden Handshake Award now? Um, James Tedesco, of course. We thank you, Uncle Nick, uh, for sponsoring this award. He's the front runner at this point, but who do you think will win the Golden Handshake for you? Kieran Foran at this point. I mean, Jesus. He deserves one, the poor bugger. He bucket. does. I, I, I felt, you know... I, I've always liked Kieran Foran actually mm. as a player. I mean, it's, he's, he's had a bit of a tumultuous career, um, but uh, you know, for a guy in, in that position, and and um, you know, the amount of hits he's taken, and how how little speaking of people who haven't had much regard for their own safety, um, yeah, I, I thought I thought it was a real shame. It was a really innocuous looking tackle, um, but I thought it was a real shame for him to to cop another big injury like that. I agree with you, mate. It is, it's a tragedy not only for him, but I think for NRL as well mm. because I don't think we're going to see the best of Kieran Foran. I think, mm. you know, he started his career at Manly uh, to great acclaim. I mean, three or four seasons in a row playing at the top level. And ever since then, it has been a pretty checkered history, uh, largely due to injury and slash off-field incidents. But uh, you've got to feel sorry for him. As you said there, it's just a consecutive major injuries. Uh, they're not they're not sort of small things. Um I worry that from here on in, he may not have a future in the NRL because of this. You do see it from time to time, though, right? Players will recover. I mean, it's, it's a shoulder injury, and it's apparently they found further damage, you know, underneath the damage that they were repairing. So he's going to have to. Have oh, that's a nice, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So they, they're going to have to have a second surgery, and that's why it's looking so bad. Sorry, Kieran. Uh, we're just fixing your shoulder up, and we've noticed you've got osteoporosis. Um, so we're going to do that. But first of all, uh, you have autism. So we need to try to work on that first. I mean, it's one of those kind of perpetual motion things, isn't it? That uh, I think you'll I, never walk out of the hospital again. To, to be to be fair, if I was going to pick a half who had autism uh, out of the old manly duo, it would probably be Cherry Evans. Just, be, uh, just putting it out there. Um, Canadians, what are they known for? Maple syrup, smearing it on their genitals and letting a bear lick it off. But on this occasion, uh, we're actually referring to them because the Toronto Wolfpack... Xander uh, is making a big splash uh, in terms of their representation, and uh, none more so than the last couple of weeks because they've made a, a, they've landed rather a really big signature. Can you let our listeners know who it is? In fact, they probably do know, um, but try to sound surprised. I think it's impossible to sound surprised at this point because everybody knows that Sonny Bill Williams, a champion Roosters player. There's no other side he's played for that's more high profile than that. But um, <laughs> uh, champion Roosters player and premiership winner. Um, for us, uh, has joined the Toronto Wolfpack on a deal worth ten million bucks for two seasons. Not not bad cash. Now, is that in Canadian dollars? So it's it's. Uh, I think it's what is it? Because I think that's quite equitable it's, to it's, the Australian dollar. It's nine point six in, or nine point five in Canadian. It's ten million Australian. How the it's, fuck do you know that? <laughs> How are you across the Canadian I, exchange rate? I have, I have been following uh, the Wolfpack since their inception, and you've also yeah. followed the money markets. <laughs> Along with it. Yes. Yep. I'll tell you one thing about you, Xander. You really cross your T's and dot your I's when it comes to your NRL research. Please go on. It's, it's an, important to make sure you get the exchange rate because we, we need to know how much he's going to have to spend when he comes back to help us in the coaching ranks. That's right, um, which is another story in itself. Exactly. Um, Nick Politis very much has his eye on Sonny Bill Williams in the future. Um, now, the Toronto Wolfpack, they're entering the English Super League. Um, have they landed any other huge names apart from Sonny Bill? Uh, Fui Fui Moi Moi was one of their, their big signings early on. And you can just imagine Fui Fui Moi Moi when they're playing in like League Three in the English Super League, just steamrolling these part timers. <laughs> Welcome to the Canadian League. We've got Fui Fui Moi Moi lining up against potential speed humps here. Uh, that's right. He's crushed another ball boy. <laughs> there was, there that was sounds game. nothing like a Canadian. There was, for the record. <laughs> definitely. Um, uh, definitely more American, I think. But, <laughs> yeah, I think but, so. But you just have to, like, there were scores early on. I was following their, their, like they've had a great social media presence. They've been a really well run, slick organization. I'm a, I'm a big fan of them. Um, but what they, about their on field performances? Well, they, they, so early on, they were, they were putting like 70, 80 points on teams because they had basically <laughs> full time professionals playing against part time. But who were they playing? This is the thing. Just, were they playing like a partial representation of the Canadian Mounties? No, I mean, no, what so were they? The, the, no. So if you don't, if you don't un, uh, have the background, they they bid into the English uh, lower league. So they yeah. the only way they could get entry was by effectively offering to fly over the teams that they were going to be facing for their home games because <laughs> you know th these are not rich teams, right? Yeah. They're, they're made up of you know semi pros at best, and the particularly the, the, the lower divisions. Yeah. Um. So they couldn't afford. 
to be, you know, basically flying across the Atlantic every week. Um, so they had to do it themselves, and they're led by that um, Australian billionaire and local Canadian counterparts, I think, um, David Argyle. Uh, so they just funded up the cash and, and flew over the players. I was going to ask you, I mean, clearly they've got a revenue stream coming from somewhere, so it is coming from major entrepreneurs, is that yeah, right? Yeah, effectively, it's, it's, it's a, 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 an Australian billionaire who's been over in Canada for a while and, and wanted to, you know, Wants to make it big in England. What an identity crisis it's, that man has. It's, it's, well, I mean, it's, it's quite clever. And I, in a, a lot of ways... What's he's long game for the leadership in Zimbabwe? <laughs> it could be next. You never know. <laughs> but I, I, have to, I have a lot of respect for him because it's, it's interesting as an approach. And I, it makes me kind of like the idea of a promotion relegation system. Mm. Um, you want to see that in the NRL, don't you? Well, I mean, it's really hard to do just given the way all of our juniors and other competitions are set up. But what, what it... It illustrates the, the Toronto case to me is basically a way for you to fix the um, problem with um, expansion teams. Mm. You, you know, I, I don't like the idea of relocating teams. I think you piss off too many people. Unless it's South. Yeah. Well, I'd love to see them in Rockhampton, personally. <laughs> or Antarctica, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Base 12. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. uh, who are we playing this week? No one. Just stay there. <laughs> anyway, but I, I like the idea of it because what what you could feasibly do is um, what you could feasibly do is have uh, you know a shorter season in the NRL, um, focused maybe on the top 14 teams, mm. um, and then you just you do have a, a, a few lower divisions, and you would allow say you know a Perth or an Adelaide or a Christchurch you know or uh, a Suva um, who are getting into the New South Wales Cup now to bid in and play in these lower leagues. And if they're good enough, then they get relegated. And then, you, you know, the, the more poorly run teams in the NRL, when they come last, they just end up in the low... They're still there. You can mm. still watch them. They're still your team. But they're just not in the top division anymore. So you could have someone like the Gold Coast Titans relocated to Fiji playing in their well, eighth division. No. You, which is where they deserve to be, by they, the way. They would, that's the beauty Or have of I completely it. misread your scenario? Entirely. Um, With intention, I think. <laughs> it's just... But you don't, that's the point, is you don't really care. The Titans just end up, end up playing in Division 12. Oh, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, mate. Throw me a bone. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, that's kind of why I like the idea of it. They, they bid in. You've got um, now New York looking to bid in. As I, I said. love that. You could end up with a situation where New, York, New York's got their own billionaire backing, apparently. Um, then Van- Vancouver is a, the next side. Then you're looking at uh, you know West Coast American uh, cities. Mm. You could, you could, Who's New York's uh, mascot out of interest? I have no idea. Actually, I don't think they've, they've come up with specifically their, their, their I, name. I think you're wrong. On Twitter, I was looking at yeah. it, and it was a, a, an emblem of the Twin Towers on fire, which I loved because it's that kind of <laughs> railing against the world. I don't think we're going to win too many fans in New York with this podcast. At the moment. <laughs> just, just putting it out there. <laughs> Can I just say, if our podcast is reaching... The very few New York fans. Then I say, all power to us. <laughs> we're not reaching them anymore. <laughs> tell you that much. Um, no, but we're very popular in Islamabad now. So. <laughs> it's just another. Um, it's another. Te- another chapter. I mean, uh, cell. No, a uh, team. It's another team. <laughs> yeah, <funny>. Apparently. <laughs> uh, no, but I love this idea, and we. we I know we've only uh, we're sort of digressed from Toronto specifically, but do you, are Toronto going to be a force in the English Super League? Yeah, I absolutely think they will. I mean, I, I like the idea because. They're going to shake things up a little bit because their their competition. They've had the salary cap um, in place, but they've only had four champions, you know, out of twelve teams for I think something like twenty five years. Mm. You know, Bradford were one of the regulars, and then they fell under the bus. Um, you know, overspending on players and mismanaging their issues. Um, but it hasn't been a terribly open competition. So having new entrants from you know an interesting uh, consortia who just want to grow the game in a new market come yeah. in. I think it's it's going to be fantastic, and you could end up with the situation where you have enough critical mass to have almost like a North American division, uh, you know, and have it as a conference. That'd be system. amazing. And you do that, you you, you suddenly have a completely different uh, global rugby league uh, uh, competitive environment. And you, you actually, is this, I mean, I reckon I sense a lot of listeners are going to be listening to this, thinking, "Is this pie in the sky stuff?" I know you sound very passionate about it, but is there ever going to be a North American, like a legitimate force? For rugby league in North America, I, I think this potential. I've always, I've always felt that um, you know, and, and, and as somebody who's been watching a lot more American football over the last few years as well. Yeah, uh, I've always said you've been sucked into American culture. <laughs> you're, you're incredibly woke these <laughs> days, which has been the most irritating <laughs> I, thing. I don't, don't know if woke would be quite the term for me, but um, 
I, I, I've always felt that from a just purely uh, from a fan engagement standpoint, there's so much more uh, that rugby league has. Uh, I think you know, in terms of it's it, the way the game is structured for American fans to grasp onto, yep. as opposed to rugby union. That rugby's um, uh, union's obviously going to have a lot of traction just because sevens is now an Olympic sport and they they get the World mm. Cup and all the rest of it. But I think league is you know when you sit down with Americans to watch it, um, and you know I've done this. You know, in bars with American colleagues of mine, watching uh, Rugby World Cup games versus having watched State of Origin or the NRL finals, they get NRL a lot easier. It's it, we, if you sit sit there trying to explain why this scrum collapsed and they get three points, it's, mm. it's very hard. Well, to... I feel the same way. But are we? I mean, by saying that league is potentially more popular in North America than Rugby Union, are we almost saying like? Uh, you know, in Iraq, we think marbles will be slightly better, more popular than tiddlywinks. <laughs> I mean, I mean, at what scale are we looking at? No, here? I think I, no, I think there's actually a genuinely uh, interesting discussion to have there because you know one thing that rugby has always had going for it, Union, uh, is that they have had the university system to themselves in the United States and mm. North America in general, and yeah. same in Japan. The reason they've there is an international scene to speak of in a lot of countries and and, and a budding professional system for Union is because they've had this presence throughout the, the these educational situations by you know by laying a foundation where you have a professional publicly uh, engaged uh, 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 you know footprint in these markets if you were to get new york uh, toronto and you know maybe i don't know san francisco or something and can we get idaho Coast, in there why not fuck I, it. I mean <laughs> sorry that's an absolute game changer for me <laughs> I think I think the Midwest is definitely where. <laughs> now, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I'd be I'd be focusing on on big cities with with clear um, identities, um, yeah. you know, and and trying to build that into that 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 uh, relationship with the English Super League because it, what it, it achieves two things. First of all, it, it makes it more interesting, and it, it actually breaks out of that M sixty two corridor from the from even from a UK standpoint. Yeah. Whereas in England, you know, you kind of find where you speak to people in places like London and they're like, oh, it's just that Northerner game. But all of a sudden, no, it's it's not just the Northerner game anymore. It's a game that they also have a pro team in Vancouver, Toronto, New mm. York and fucking Yeah, they're Seattle. trying to become truly global. And, and I think that's a yeah. um, an admirable characteristic for rugby league competitions around the world that, you know, we do want to become global and the global footprint should make a difference. Um, I guess my my uh, questioning is is more about, you know, what timeline are we looking at here? Is this something that we're, we're probably looking at 40, 50 years down the track or right. could we be seeing in the next 10 years it took, a team from New York playing it took, competitively? It took Toronto three years. Yeah. Uh, With the backing that, of a mining magnate, or yeah, and yeah. but that, that's the, that's the model that he's using. So he's, yeah. you know, the, the billionaires' club is is a large one now. I can't wait to Nick Politis buys them. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> Mate, I'm very conscious of time. This has been a fascinating podcast. I never um, congratulate our podcast for anything, uh, but you've certainly added a lot more insight to it this time around. Um, do you think we've left our listeners with any kind of major value sets that they can take with them? Is there something you want to say to them right before we go uh, to leave a lasting impression on them? In fact, let me give you a leading question. What would you like to say to our listeners about Darius Boyd's veganism? Certainly can't play worse. <laughs> I have no idea where that came from. But. I think uh, Darius Boyd would be better off eating a live kangaroo on the field just to fire him up a little bit. Um, I think he needs to lay off the tofu. I, I, I think know. he needs to get the muscle mass back. In fact, I want to see him become an especially carnivorous to the point where he starts to eat other players on the field as well, uh, namely Anthony Milford. Um, but uh, Xander, we, we do thank you. <laughs> Xander, we do thank you so much for joining us, mate. We hope you come in again. And uh, you know, you have uh, you've come off the reserve bench today, and I think you played very well. I think you've landed a spot in the permanent team. Uh, in fact, you've become the Ray Thompson of the Voluntary Tackle Podcast. Uh, so listeners, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, if you want to follow us, you can see us on Twitter. We're at Voluntary Tackle. Uh, you can also email um, uh, to Gmail and just email Google. Uh, we don't actually have an email address, but just email Google. They'll give you the rest. Uh, and until next time, uh, please, if you see Joey Lalua, try to hit him with a harpoon gun. See ya. See ya.